All right, for this next video, I want to talk about six reasons um, that dad should stop drinking alcohol. I'm talking about this from a very personal uh, level. You know, all of these videos that are aimed at fathers are, they're sort of a wish that I could go back and, and do the same thing, uh, you know, do all these things that I'm saying to you now, you know, I wish I could go back to when I was, uh, um, when my son was born, when I was 20, 25, 26 years of age and just change all these things, but I can't, right? Um, I mean, I've, I'm sort of stuck where I am now, so uh, the next best thing is teaching my son and trying to teach as many other people. So here's six things that I would do again, or six mindsets that I would have. The first one is responsibility. Um, it's only with hindsight, you know, from an outward perspective that I can look back on my own irresponsibility, how irresponsible I actually was back in those days, um, all throughout my, my son's childhood, really. Um, not in the behavior that I was doing, you know, it's, it's easy to see, sometimes uh, it's easy to look back on yourself and look back at it with regret and to, uh, to sort of really beat yourself up about these things. But um, I think once you've, you've got as far into this journey as I am now, it's easier to see things without judging. You know, it can still be painful, um, but as I said, you know, the best scenario for me would be if I could go back and I could stop drinking when Sean was born. But I'm happy I stopped at 46 when I did. Um, it still gave me a lot of room for improvement, a lot of room for uh, getting to my potential in life. Uh, and also for, from my son's perspective, you know, to try and give him, um, a bit of a, a, a leg up, so to speak. So would I have taken notice if somebody had pointed out to me in the middle of my drinking, right? My dad used to say to me, watch out for your liver. Or he'd say to me, um, be careful of your health, you know, you're drinking a bit much or things like that. But nobody ever said to me, be careful about what you're teaching your son or be careful about what Sean sees. Um, now, most parents understand that their choice to have a kid comes with responsibility for that kid um, how you act how, how you behave it all lays down the template for your child uh, and how they're you know the, the template that they're most likely going to follow as they get older right um this is from a conscious level and from a subconscious level, level from a good level and a bad level you know it doesn't um there's, there's no morals here or there's no set morals um, it's all dependent on what you teach them. Um, so what you set is the precedent for attitudes, beliefs, behaviors. Uh, and that's a huge responsibility. You know, if we live at the moment now, uh, in this moment, in, in a world of instant gratification, and I think that it's destroying um, many or all levels of our culture. It's destroying a lot of... Uh, what we think a lot of our values individually. Um, you know, the vast majority of medical problems that we've got in hospitals now and going to doctors are caused by uh, lifestyle choices. You know, it's caring about more about what people feel in the moment rather than what's good for them long term. And, you know, every child has got the right to live in a world organized and run by adults. And it's really a terrible thought to think that. Um, children are now being raised with parents who are, are who are acting and behaving like adolescents. You know, what message does that send out? Now, this is from my perspective as a person who stopped drinking alcohol for 10 years. So I'm seeing things from a very clear perspective now, from a different perspective to what I was seeing it before. And if I go back and look at my own behavior, then I have to say that I was acting like and behaving like an adolescent all the way up until I stopped drinking alcohol. And then I started to think about what I was doing and that changed a lot of um, how I was acting. So um, you give your children a crucial start. So there is acting like a mature adult is what gives your, your um, child that really, um, that great start in life, you know? And when I was sitting on that balcony in 2012, looking out, out watching my son walking backwards and forwards across that beach, um, that's one of the first thoughts that I had about myself, that it's time to, to, to grow up. And part of that process of growing up, however late I was at arriving at that particular event, um, was facing up to the responsibilities 
that I had for myself as a dad, right? Like I said, however late it was, my son was 21 at the time. And I mean truly facing up to those. You know, looking at myself and looking at what I was doing and what I could do from going forward from that perspective from then on. Um, you know, we have to face reality as it is, not as we wish it would be. You know, we have to accept the consequences of our actions on ourselves, but we also have to accept, as fathers, the consequences of our actions on our children. You know, and do any of us really do that from a young age? Um, you know, as fathers, it's our job to protect our children. First and foremost, that's our job, to protect and to look after them physically, but we've also got to create strong minds, to create resilient behaviors, to create healthy habits, and cognitive consonants. You've heard of cognitive dissonance, right? Well, cognitive consonance is an inner state of harmony. It's an inner state of consistency. They're consistent with their attitudes, their be behaviors, their beliefs, and or their knowledge. So all of this inside is consistent that they haven't got these big internal conflicts that we have got. Now, I spoke earlier about the internal conflicts and the hesitancy when people stop drinking alcohol. And that's partly because of this cognitive dissonance, right? This is an internal inconsistency. So we've got in inconsistent attitudes, we've got inconsistent beliefs, behaviors. And kids see this, you know, kids are not stupid. You know, even though we don't treat it as such, alcohol is a drug. You know, we as alcohol drinkers are drug users and your children learn mostly by mimicking. And like I said, that's a big responsibility that I thought about on that balcony and for weeks and months afterwards that my son had been copying off exactly what I've been doing and it turned into almost a very younger version of what I was, was heading down that track, you know. Um, I never thought it was such a big deal for me when I was when my son was a, a kid, for him to see me drinking the odd glass of wine or the odd beer, uh, to see me drunk. Um, I thought I was being a good dad, a great dad, when I bought him his first legal pint on his 18th birthday. You know, hindsight makes everything much, much clearer. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to see the problems in others. When you can't see the problems in yourself, I get that, right? But fortunately, it's often through your own bad judgment that you start to to open up to and see reality for the first time, to see reality as it is or to see reality as you are creating it in the world and in turn to start to develop a good judgment yourself. You know, um, there's a great saying that youngsters these days or people these days are Disneyfying life um, and you can Disneyfy life as much as you want but at the end of the day, reality doesn't care. As parents, there's no way that we can control every aspect of our child's upbringing, nor would um, there be any guarantees if we could, right? So what we can do, uh, again, learning from my own hard lessons in hindsight, is to set them up for success by doing our best to show them the right path, right? Right, that's enough for the first one. Number two is um, time is the only thing that you cannot get back. Your time with your kids um, is, a, is a, a big ticking clock. Um, my th son is 30 now, He's got a, I've got a grandchild and I haven't seen him in a year, this is COVID, so um, I get to see him three or four times a year now. And I make the most of those times, but you know, I remember coming home every day and just seeing my son every, every night and you, you sort of take it for granted at the time until it's gone. Um, and there's a big responsibility with being a parent, being a dad. There's a lot of moving parts. Um, there's a lot of other commitments that you've got to work on. So you, sometimes you have to make up, you have to create free time with your children. Uh, and the more involved you can be as a dad, the better. And a drunk dad, a drugged up dad is not an involved dad, right? You cannot be an involved dad if you're poisoning yourself. You're poisoning your mind. So, you know, play the tape of just one drink. You know, one drink reduces your capacity to think. Um, it slightly affects your your ability to sleep properly. You wake up in the morning feeling a little bit more tired. Your mood and your focus are a bit off. Concentration, your drive are a little bit off. 
And this slightly affects everything else that you do. Now think about that as a compounding effect. You've heard of the butterfly effect, chaos theory. Um, this is where butterfly flaps its wings in one part of the world and two or three weeks later there's a, there's a hurricane in another part of the world. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions is one small change results in large differences in a later stage, right? So um, just think about one thing that you do affects another thing and another thing and another thing, right? So think about that and extrapolate that out to a lot of drinks and how that affects your life and how that affects your sleep and how that affects your mood, right? Think about how you are affected by alcohol, how much time is wasted on being wasted. You know, is that something that you want your children to learn? Is that something that you want your children to learn specifically from you? You know, it's has to be my biggest regret in life that I didn't stop alcohol, like I said, and I didn't teach my son by example. You know, you've got a narrow window with this. Um, time goes quick and the earlier you can lay good foundations for your children, the better. All right, number three is missing out. Now, missing out on um, not being present in not remembering precious moments. One of the things that I had when I stopped drinking alcohol for the first time, um, when I stopped drinking alcohol for good, it was maybe four or five months after I'd stopped and I pulled out this box of photographs that I hadn't seen in a while. Um, they were the old type of photographs, you know, the, the ones that you, um, you know, nowadays you've got a digital camera and you can just snap and snap and snap and snap and people probably don't even go back looking over the photographs, you know, for a long time. Back in the day, when I was a kid, when, when, when I was young, when my son was a kid, there was the, you bought, you bought 36 photographs and then you, um, you sorted them out by, uh, you had to pay extra money. So it was probably about 30 quid to buy the photographs, to buy the film, to go off and take the photographs and then to get them developed at the end of it. 30, 30 euros, 40 euros, whatever it was at the time. And um, so photographs were precious. And every one of those photographs that I can see in there were all of precious moments. And 90% of them I couldn't remember because for me, celebration was always having a drink. So, you know, when your kids are grown up, when you um, are looking back at your memories, they're the things that are supposed to keep you smiling to remember those things. And I still remember some of the things when my son was a kid, it wasn't that bad, but there's a lot of stuff that I don't remember and, and I should remember. So it's only, um, often that you realize these things long after the events have passed and it's too late you know you can't go back to these things time goes quickly um, imagine being fully present in their lives when you you know if if i'd have gone back and stopped at day one i'd have been fully present building up a huge store of clear memories and another aspect of this is that because you're not there either physically or mentally um you know think about not being there because you haven't been looking after yourself. You know, listen again to the premature death and the health condition stats that I talked about in one of the other videos. You owe it to your kids, to your grandchildren, to your great grandchildren, right? To be there as long as possible, to not only see your kids get married, but to see your grandchildren get married. Um, number four is that you're, you are your child's best teacher. Um, you know, nobody's going to, care about your child as much as you you love them and um only you have their best best interests at heart you're the the only person you're as a parent and the other parent as well um who has their best interests at heart you instinctively know what's best for your child but sometimes you know our thinking our behaviors our habits get in the way um and you've been their teacher from the moment that they were born you teach them their morals, you teach them how to think, how to behave, how to dress, how to eat, um, what to read, how to treat themselves, how to treat other people. You also teach them um, some of the bad things in life without even thinking about it. There was a recent study that I, I, I read about children with fathers who are present and active in their child's early life, um, that they had much better educational outcomes, they had higher IQ, better language abilities, better cognitive abilities. You know, they can better handle stress and frustrations in life. They're more patient. I mean, these things are all important factors when they grow up. 
Um, children from highly involved fathers have a 43% higher likelihood to earn uh, the most A's in a class and 33% less likely to have to repeat a grade. You know, they're, they're more likely to be emotionally secure, confident, have better exploration and socialization skills and abilities. You know, dads particularly encourage achievement, independence. Um, they have a, uh, their kids, they, they put this push towards the outside world that mothers don't, you know. I mean, I found it hard to, to, to let go of my son, but there is a certain push. That you have to go out and do this on your own, and dads are good at doing that. They're also essential in developing emotional regulation, impulse control, self-control, uh, and much more when it comes to social behaviours. Now, on the other side of that, 15% uh, of children have asked their parents to drink less. 16% of parents have felt guilty or ashamed of their parenting as a result of their drinking. 12% uh, said that their parents paid them less attention because of their drinking. And these are 11 and 12 year olds, right? These are kids that are, sorry, you know, copying onto these things now. They described alcohol as like sugar for adults and said that their parents drink to solve their problems. So they get these things, you know. Now, in recent times, there has been a switch from drinking in bars and pubs to going to supermarkets and liquor stores. And children are seeing their parents drinking more. Now, this is especially true. This was happening before the pandemic, uh, before the uh, COVID pandemic. And it's especially true since the pandemic, you know, during the pandemic. It's just normalizing alcohol. Um, number five is that you are their first role model. You know, whether you like it or not, you're, you're their primary role model. You're their first role model. And you're probably going to be the one, especially if you've got boys that are um, going to treat you as a role model for life. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a time when you disappoint your children. I mean, I think that's just one of those those facts of life but um, I think in general uh, you know I look back at my own father and think he did a great job um, you know there were certain things I look back at him and go oh. but you know there there go I I mean I did a lot more stuff um, that wasn't uh, being a father I wish I was like my dad you know uh, for me that translated to be better you know to work on myself to be a better uh, father to try and be the best father they can be you know hypocrisy just doesn't work on children they can smell it a mile away um, you know you can talk about the dangers of drugs uh, but the kids know that what you're doing is just as bad you know or they, you know you can talk about the dangers of drugs uh, you can talk about the dangers of heroin I mean there's, there's a certain anxiety that you can uh, place into your children about certain drugs and you can do that from a young age but at the same time you give them a you're teaching them that alcohol is uh, is that they're ambivalent about alcohol or even worse that they, they've got a positive attitude towards alcohol uh, and they don't see alcohol the same way um, so th th this is what I was talking about about you know you having the earning the right to be heard with your children you know, children as young as seven can think critically about reputation and the re repercussions of um, the way that things are representative in a, in a, in a false way. You know, children who see their parents drunk or tipsy are much less likely to see them as positive role models. They're less likely to listen and act on what they say. Uh, you know, actions speak louder than words. You know, you've got to earn the right to, to be heard in these things. Um, Another one is uh, long-term, thinking about things in the long-term. This is the final one. And this is your legacy. I mean, this is where I'm sort of hoping that I can make amends for a lot of the stuff that happened uh, a lot of the, the times when I was drinking or I wasn't there for my son, that I can be there in the long-term. You know, and this is stopping thinking about short-term thinking, thinking about instant gratification, and thinking about long-term thinking and acting. It's passing down uh, sort of beneficial va values and virtues and helping your children to grow um, with their needs already met, you know, so that they get into young adulthood with, um, you know, they've, they've got that fairly complex uh, needs hierarchy already under control that their security needs are met and they can start to pursue some of the higher needs 
um, it's easier for them to to move on to live that better possible version of themselves and maybe even to get to self-actualization you know you're the beginning of the next generations who you are now um who your great 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 grandchildren are going to be that all starts here with you you know you can break individual cycles you know my parents drank and my great grandparents drank my grandparents drank my great grandparents you know I, I don't know how how many generations that go back so you have to start thinking from yourself down generationally you know how are your great great grandchildren going to live how will they think how will they be, behave you know that journey starts right here with with you and your children one of the most profound books i read um was called sins of our fathers uh when i went to ireland in 1978 we moved from the uk from yorkshire i had a really strong yorkshire accent and it was at the height of the troubles uh, six years after bloody sunday and there was just signs everywhere saying brits out like i said i had this um thick yorkshire accent and i felt very troubled in myself uh, I, I lost the english accent very quickly i adopted uh, a dublin accent very quickly i started talking like that you know no worries and um just trying to fit in and i did uh, there were certain parts of uh parts of the especially the adults in my life uh didn't like the accent at all where we moved to in dublin my dad was a dub my mum was from the uk um and i just wanted to understand where where all this was coming from and that book was one of the first books that i read uh, when i was around 15 i think and it was basically about the the parents in northern ireland not just the fathers but the parents and the way that they um they raised their children to be bigoted and they raised their children to have a complete hatred for the opposition and not just on the catholic side on the protestant side as well so both sides hated each other's guts i remember going out with a girl from uh place called newton stewart in uh in northern ireland and it there was a she lived in a village of a couple of thousand people thousand protestants a thousand catholics and they literally couldn't stand each other you know they would uh, yeah it was just so much animosity that i i i mean i didn't understand that but this book really laid the foundation for me to understand that you pass the things down to your children oh unfortunately i didn't learn the lesson early enough about this uh, for myself and, and alcohol anyway when i finish this now just ask yourself a couple of questions are you leading a good example as a dad you know um are you working on your own self-improvement as a way that models the self-improvement that you want to see in your own child um are you actively modeling your self-improvement in front of your children including making all this stuff public warts and all you know if if you're not working on yourself is it fair to ask your child to work on themselves as well so anyway i'm going to see you in the next video we're going to talk about moderation and uh, the madness of moderation all right take care of yourself speak to you again bye